Okay, we are back with Nehemia Gordon, and I want to ask you, um, tell me more about how you first began interacting with Christians. Yeah, and, and it's interesting. If you would have told me 20 years ago, um, when I was an undergrad at Hebrew University, you know, one day you'll be traveling around and you'll be speaking in churches, and I would have said, you're out of your mind. <laughs> um, I, I'll never do that. I want nothing to do with Christians, and 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 the, and really, it was it was interacting with people who would come to Israel, Christian tourists, who had this yearning to understand the the Old Testament mm -hmm. and interacting with them and talking with them. And, and what that did is it wasn't just something from the pages of history, the people who persecuted us, which I had learned about, you know. In my upbringing, we learned about, you know, the Crusaders who massacred more people in, in the Rhine Valley than they did in Israel. Yes. You know, they said, why should we go all the way to the Holy Land to kill the infidels? We have the infidels among us, meaning let's kill the Jews here. Why go yes. Yes. kill the Muslims in, in the Holy Land? That was, that was my understanding of what Christians were, you know, this history of persecution. But then when I actually sat down and talked with real people and heard their, their passion for the creator of the universe and their love for, for prophecy and, and the Bible, the Old Testament especially, I realized, okay, so these aren't just our persecutors. These are real people who love the God of Israel as much as I do. And what broke my heart is when they would, they would, you know, they would tell me how they, they wanted to understand the, the, they wanted to understand Jesus. And in wanting to understand Jesus, they were studying things about Judaism, which didn't exist at the time of Jesus, which were obvious to anybody with a Jewish background <laughs> and history of Judaism. You know, you're talking about something that started in the 1700s or 1600s, and you're projecting that into the time of Jesus. It broke my heart to see that. And I realized I need to share this information with people who, who yearn for the information. Mm -hmm. You know, when I've actually spoken at churches um, where people will say, wait a minute, you're not a Christian. Why are, you, why are you here? And my response to those people is, well, I was invited to speak. Why are you here? Why'd you come here to, <laughs> to hear what I, you know, this is an event Sunday afternoon after church. Why'd you come to hear me if, if you don't want to? I'm here because I was invited by the pastor to share with you my knowledge from ancient Judaism. And if you don't want to hear that, that's fine. I'm, my calling is to teach those who want to know the information. If you don't want to hear what I have to say, that doesn't, doesn't matter to me. You don't have to be here. I'm not offended by it. I'm really not. It's totally fine. Now, this book I wrote, The Hebrew Yeshua versus the Greek Jesus, is a book I would have never thought I would ever write. If you would have told me this <laughs> 25 years ago, I would have said, you need to be institutionalized. I will never <laughs> say... And what it came out of a friend of mine who was Messianic, a Messianic Jew, coming to me and um, with this problem in the Gospel of Matthew. And he explained to me the problem, and I said, well, I see there's a problem, but it's your problem, not mine. Because <laughs> I'm not, you know, I look to live my life according to the Old Testament, not the Gospel of Matthew. But I had been working on the Dead Sea Scrolls at that point, studying ancient Hebrew manuscripts. He said, okay, can you use those skills to try to understand Matthew as an ancient Jewish document? Mm -hmm. And what I ended up discovering was this Hebrew version of the Gospel of Matthew, which is so exciting. We could talk for hours just about that. And, and I didn't really even discover it. It had been discovered by a Christian scholar at a university back in the 1980s, way before I ever knew about it, I just read his book and understood it because Hebrew was just so, you know, clear to me that what he, when I read it in Hebrew, it was just so clear that everything he was saying was correct, or 90% of what he was saying was correct, and, and that if we applied yes. this to these issues in the Gospel of Matthew, we could discover all kinds of amazing things. Now, when I first did this research, I brought it back to this Messianic man, and I said to him, you know, you need to share this with people. This is really important. Th this could be life-changing to people. And we sat for over an hour, just, I was explaining to him, you know, this word and that manuscript and this other word and another Hebrew manuscript. And, and at the end, he looked at this and he said, you know, I, I can't go and tell people about this. I, I don't know, can't read Hebrew manuscripts. No one will yeah, believe yeah, this from me. Yeah. You need to share this with people. And I said, well, that's the one thing I'll never do. Because if I get up there, if I, if I share this with people and I'm sharing how actually the Gospel of Matthew is internally consistent when you understand it, you know, there's these apparent yes. contradictions yes. in the Greek um, that scholars have struggled with for, for centuries and most Christians just dismiss but you read it in Greek and you're like this doesn't make sense um, Jesus must not have really said this that's what scholars say Christian scholars but when you read it in Hebrew what Yeshua said there is internally consistent I said I can't share that with people you know from my background the only time I should be talking about Jesus or his, as he was known thousands of years ago yeah. Yeshua should be to convince Christians not to believe in him and you're telling me I, I need to share this with people about how what he said was internally consistent? I'll be tarred and feathered, <laughs> tarred and feathered driven out of town. And, and look, in the end, I, I ended up praying about it, and I decided I need to share this with people because it's true. 
what I found in the Hebrew Gospel of Matthew I think is true and I've got to share it with people. And you ask my sister who's an Orthodox Jew and she'll tell you, she says to me, she says, why do you have this unhealthy interest in Jesus? <laughs> That's how she describes it. And, um, and, and my response to my sister and people like that is, show but, me what I've written here which isn't true. It, it, it's historical truth. And how can, you know, and I think people who look to Jesus as their Messiah yeah. should know what he said in its historical truthful context yes and that's yes. all it's really about for me is yes. truth you know, yes yes it's sharing but, with that with people who want to know about it but by the way i think many of our viewers have had a yeah. brother or sister in their family <laughs> as a christian also say what what is this about your unhealthy interest in jesus <laughs> even as a christian okay but, or maybe uh, but, it's a unhealthy <laughs> interest in judaism <laughs> well yeah you know, that, 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 from yes, that perspective yes, now that i originally be. did not intend to write a book but, but uh, so before you yeah, leave that, you yeah. said you prayed. That was just interesting. Yeah. Uh, what, what did that prayer look like? Well, it was really, um, you want to know the truth? It was, God, please don't make me do this. <laughs> <laughs> this is going to, the, the cost, and what I mean by the, the social and emotional cost of this will just be too high. Um, and look, I lost friends I had for a decade who, when I put out this book, didn't want anything to do with it. Okay. Me. And I originally didn't intend to publish a book. I really wrote, I was at that point still immersed in academia and I wrote it up as this very nerdy academic paper um, that I was going to publish. And um, a, few things other, a few other things happened. Then I decided eventually to make it more accessible and I was going to put it up on the internet as a PDF. And a very dear friend of mine who had written a few books, he said, if you put it up on the internet as a PDF, no one will, put, no one will pay attention to it. He said, if you don't sell it as a book, People won't assign value to yeah, it, yeah. and I'm like, oh, I, I can't do this. What will this do to my academic career? Putting out a book because it's not, it's not uh, an yeah. academic paper. It's a, it's a what we call a popular book. Yeah, yes. And, and, and scholars say that in, in a <laughs> in a derogatory, book, yes. a der yeah. very derogatory <laughs> way. But I felt I eventually knew he was right, and I decided to do it. And um, and look, I've had people who have come to me and and you know told me that. They read the book and then bought 20 copies, one for each of their friends and family and, and another 10 for their enemies. Because, <laughs> you yeah. know, it, there were things in that they haven't gotten from anywhere else. And it was, not, or they could I, get I've it read from, the book, yes. Or they could it's, get it from uh, other sources, but where they had to read a 500 page academic book. And here I presented it in like 100 pages, 125 pages, where it's, I think, pretty accessible. So. Um, it's in the book. Uh, you talk about the uh, the Hebrew uh, version of Matthew mm -hmm. that dates to yeah. around the 1200, and you uh, postulate, if yeah. that's the right word, yeah. that, that there ought to have been earlier versions uh, of Hebrew. Um, do you think it is uh, absolutely necessary in your mind and from your research, is it, is it necessary that Matthew first drafted this in Hebrew? Do, do you think it, it's, it doesn't even work if he yeah. drafted it in Greek uh, with the, knowing, knowing Hebrew yeah. and so forth, you know, uh, and maybe yeah. including a few Hebrew words here and there? Yeah. Does it, but does that, does, is that even so, a possibility? So, in your first mind? of all, it's very possible that Matthew wrote the gospel in Greek, and that really doesn't change anything in the book because other scholars have come along and shown how this. They say, look, this Hebrew version of Matthew can't be a Hebrew original. Because we all know Matthew wrote his gospel in Greek. And by, we yeah. all know, they mean, the academic consensus is that it was written in Greek. And they say, so then how do we deal with Professor Howard's uh, claims that, and I say Professor Howard because I didn't discover Hebrew Matthew. Right. It was a man named George Howard. Right. He shows very conclusively that there's ancient things in the Hebrew version of the gospel of Matthew. You, it's hard to really dispute what he says. So these other scholars have come along and they say, we can't explain it, but somehow this Hebrew version of Matthew was translated from a very early Latin version, which goes back to a lost Greek version, and that's how it has these things that seem to be original. Um, now, I don't agree with them. I, think it was, I do think it was written in Hebrew and transmitted over the generations. Um, it may have also been written in Greek. In other words, we have the example of Josephus who tells us that he, you know, Josephus wrote this very long book, yes. and he tells us in his introduction that he couldn't write it in Greek. He wrote it in Hebrew, and then had an assistant help him translate it into Greek. Okay, okay. And, yeah. and, and Howard brought that out, that's, that's Professor Howard, and he says that's probably what happened with Matthew, in his opinion. He wrote this in 1987. He called it the Gospel of Matthew according to a primitive Hebrew text. And he hypothesized that Matthew was written in Hebrew and then translated by Matthew himself into Greek. 
And yes. over the generations, things may have been lost in the Greek that were preserved in the Hebrew. There could be things lost in the Hebrew. I still say, people say, so are you, are you trying to throw away the Greek text? Absolutely not. The Greek Gospel of Matthew is the primary text of Matthew. What the Hebrew does is it's just a second witness to the original words written by Matthew. And by the way, it's the church fathers who say Matthew was written in Hebrew. Uh, Papias, who died in the year 130 approximately, he says Matthew collected the words in the Hebrew language and each translated them as he was able. Now the problem is in academia and in um, even in seminary scholarship, they say Papias didn't know what he was talking about. And then let me give you a great story. I, I wrote this book together with this Methodist pastor, uh, Keith Johnson, mm -hmm. called A Prayer to Our Father. We took the Hebrew version of the Gospel of Matthew and looked specifically at the Lord's Prayer, the Our yes. Father Prayer, yes. and, and tried to understand it from the perspective of the Hebrew Matthew, along with comparing it word for word to the Greek. Right. And, um, and Keith, of course, is coming as a Methodist. I'm coming as a Karaite Jew with an academic background and trying to meet on common ground to understand what is this beautiful prayer, the, Lord, the Our Father Prayer, what does it say? What, yes. what, how would it have been understood? To the Jewish multitudes, yeah. it was originally taught in the Sermon on the Mount, according to Matthew. Very Jewish prayer, is it not? <clears throat> Very so. Jewish prayer. We asked this question. Really, our question was, how would this prayer have been understood to the Jewish multitudes when, when Yeshua, Jesus, taught this? It's part of the Sermon on the Mount. When right. he taught the Sermon on the Mount, how would, he have under, how would the Jews hearing it have understood this? Now, when we wrote the book, we, uh, one of the things we did in the book is we wanted to find the place where Jesus taught the Sermon on the Mount, which is not so straightforward. There's a place all the tourists are taken to. But that's only been yeah. identified as, as the site of the Sermon on the Mount since 1938. Before that, there were other places, and we went to yeah. each of those places, and we looked at the sources, and we came to our conclusion of where we think it took place. When we finished writing the book, Keith sent it to one of his seminary professors. And um, he, uh, the professor wrote back, and he said, you can't find the place where Jesus wrote. And this is an evangelical scholar. He wrote back, he said, you can't find the place where Jesus taught the Sermon on the Mount. Because the Sermon on the Mount was written in Matthew's study. In other words, Matthew, after the death of Jesus, sat down and he collected all these teachings which took place at different times and in different places, and he compiled these into this fictitious event which never really took place called the Sermon on the Mount. And I was sitting there with Keith ta talking about this, and I said, so that guy's an evangelical scholar, and he doesn't even believe the basic words that are in the Gospel of Matthew. We went to the place and saw that it's plausible. We actually did this thing where he stood up on this platform and I walked out 400 feet and he was talking like this and I could understand every word he was saying. And we did some calculation that you could fit tens of thousands of people in that spot, uh, which means 5,000 would have right, been no problem right, whatsoever. Right. Right. And um, so now, did it happen or not? I don't know. I wasn't there. But I'm taking the Gospel of Matthew at faith, face value and saying, okay, here's what it says. Based on what it says, what does it mean? And the irony is that evangelical scholars don't even take it at face value, which I, I don't understand that. Maybe you can explain that to me. Well, uh, um, if it depends on who he sent it to. But uh, yeah. I, I, I would... Uh, I think it would be a rare evangelical scholar right. and who it would might come have been. to that conclusion. Right. It might have been the uh, rare evangelical scholar. Methodist scholar, scholar. yes, mm -hmm. but not no, necessarily they, they, an evangelical scholar. Yeah. But anyway, that, that's yeah. just a little bit of internal you know, Christian that's some house internal business issues. here. Look, and this but, is like the conversation but, I had with, with but, you know, the, the Reformed rabbi who said she doesn't know if Moses existed. Yes, you know? yes. So, but, but, okay, so um, if... Whether or not the original Matthew was, you know, written in, written in Hebrew and yeah. translated to to Greek uh, quickly, yeah. uh, or written in Greek and yeah. but but you could d do a do a Hebrew translation of that and and and, yeah. and go back with a Jewish mindset and yeah. capture yeah. Uh, more of the meaning. I could accept either one. Yeah. But but there is something that is not in dispute, and that is that the that the uh, that the Hebrew yeah. uh, scriptures, the Old Testament, has, yeah. was translated into Greek yeah. into in, in 200 BC, the Septuagint. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering how do you how do Jews perceive that Greek translation of their yeah. text? Yeah, so it's interesting, and I, I don't know if your your listeners know about this. That you know there was a discussion in the Talmud that the rabbis didn't want to participate in this. They didn't want it translated into Greek, and it was considered a. a a horrible thing that the Bible is translated into Greek, yes. um, but they eventually, you know, uh, uh, sort of under duress, translated it, um, and then they changed certain things so that the the, the Gentiles, who at the time weren't Christians, they were pagan Greeks, mm -hmm. so that they wouldn't be misled. They're, these are pretty well known things. Um, today, the Septuagint is generally viewed in the Jewish world as being a Christian document, um, and at first that might sound strange because it was translated in 250 BC. 
in the time of King Ptolemy of, of Egypt. Yes. Um, yes. And it was translated yes. according yes. to tradition by 70 yes. or possibly 72 rabbis. But the reality is we don't have the original one that was translated this is, this in 250 is BC. This is true, yeah. What we have are exist. copies that were preserved by Christians from the earliest ones from around the year 300 yeah. AD. Yes. Now yes. we have earlier copies that were found among the Dead Sea Scrolls. And by the way, in my uh, podcast series, Hebrew Voices, I did this amazing interview with Professor Emmanuel Tov, the editor-in-chief of the Dead Sea Scrolls. And he talks about yeah. the specific issue. And he's not talking as, as a Jewish person, you know, person who believes in Judaism. He's talking as the top academic scholar in the world on this topic. And he actually makes the remark about the Septuagint that it disappeared from the Jewish world and it only was preserved by the Christians, um, which is a fact. So the question then becomes, the original Septuagint translated in 250 BC by the 72 or 70 rabbis, is that the same as the Septuagint we have today? And the unequivocal answer is no. Very clearly the answer is, it is it's changed over time. Mm -hmm. We know that for a fact. And one of the clear things we know is, is in the earliest copies of the Septuagint we have, whenever it had the name of God, yud heh vav -Heh, the Tetragrammaton, in the Greek text, it actually is written as yud heh vav -Heh in Paleo-Hebrew letters. I see. Which we have, for example, there, there was one found at Nachal Hever, um, which dates to around the year one, 135 AD. So as late as 135 AD, the Septuagint, the Greek Bible, still had the name yud heh vav -Heh in the Hebrew. That was later repl replaced with Lord, kurios, the Greek word for Lord. So you have these changes that took place in the Greek text of the Septuagint, um, which they, means that the one we have today isn't the original. But are the changes significant? Do you, do you come to different doctrinal conclusions by reading the Septuagint in Greek versus reading, reading the Masoretic Well, text? this is a little... I, I mean, I mean yeah. you know, go ahead. So if I read, even if I read the original Septuagint from 250 BC, which we don't have, I would probably come to different doctrinal conclusions than by reading the Torah in Hebrew. And by the way, the original okay. Septuagint in 250 BC is only the five books of Moses. Uh, we have something called the Letter of Aristias. Okay. okay. Um, when okay. we talk about the Septuagint today, we mean the entire Old Testament, but originally it was the five books of Moses. Okay. The other books were translated uh, probably over the next hundred years, over in a gradual process. Um, so, yeah. So, so basically, you have. Um, I think if you read the Bible in English, you're going to come to different doctrinal conclusions <laughs> than if you come read it in Hebrew. And that's because there are things that are always lost in translation, which is why is true. my approach is to always go back to the original. You know, uh, people ask me, which Bible do you read, Nehemiah? Uh, I, did this, I did this podcast series called Torah Pearls, where I went through the 54 sections of the Torah week after week, and I, and I would be reading passages from the Bible, and people write me emails all the time. They say, which Bible were you reading? And, I, and my answer is I was <laughs> reading in Hebrew with my eyes and translating into English with my mouth. Um, there is no written translation that I'm reading. I'm, I'm translating as I'm reading it in Hebrew. Because um, if you go back to the original, then you cut out that, that issue of, of, you know, every... Yeah, this, this whole idea yeah. of, of Jews, be, that it is so cool to be able to read it and yeah. sort of translate it on the fly. Gadon yeah. can do that yeah. as well. It, it, it's, a, it's a wonderful yeah. thing. I yeah. want I, I, This has been great. I want to shift, yeah. though, yeah. And, uh, and ask you some things. I, I, because you, I've heard some fascinating stories mm -hmm. about China. So when we come yeah. back, I want to hear about China. Yeah. And if you'd be willing to tell us this uh, Isaiah 53 story that happened okay. to you. So uh, we'll, uh, we'll uh, come back in our next segment. I hope you join us.